I've been charged with discussing DREJ injuries and instability. As we all know, associated injuries are quite common. DREJ instability, soft tissue injuries that Dr. Reen will go over with you, and ulnar stylate fractures, which can occur in 50 to 60% of distal radius fractures. So to me, and I think to many of us, the DREJ is truly one of the mysteries of the wrist. Despite extensive anatomic and biomechanical studies, there's still quite a bit of debate and controversy over the stabilizing ligaments and structures. Even treatment algorithms, really complex DREJ injuries, how do you treat these? What's the right algorithm? And I think that's something we all still struggle with. To break it down, in the lecture, I hope to give you an overview of the basic anatomy of DREJ, some of the biomechanical structures and principles, and hopefully give you a treatment algorithm for treatment of DREJ instability, assessment, and treatment protocols, as well as ulnar stylate fractures. How do you go about approaching these injuries? Look at the uh, DREJ and the TFCC complex is truly a complex confluence of articular surface and stabilizing structures surrounding the distal radial ulnar joint. To break it down, looking at basic osteology, the distal radius articular surface, you have the scaphoid facet, the lunate facet, the sigmoid notch, and you have the superficial fibers of the TFCC inserting over your ulnar styloid, and the deep fibers inserting into your fovea. So we look at the DREJ, even though the ulna is fixed, when we talk about positioning of the DREJ, looking at DREJ subluxation or dislocation, we're actually describing the position of the ulna. So a dorsal DREJ subluxation is actually dorsal subluxation of the ulna and not the radius, despite the fact that the ulna is fixed. There's quite a bit of a mismatch between the articular surface of the ulnar head and the sigmoid notch. See here the radius of curvature it's approximately 10 millimeters in the ulnar head compared to 15 millimeters. That allows for quite a bit of physiologic translation, both volatilely and dorsally, and it really dependent on soft tissue constraints and ligamentous structures to provide stability. Look in the articular surface, there's approximate radius of curvature, arc of curvature of 60 degrees on the sigmoid notch compared to 90 to 140 degrees on the ulnar head, again, allowing for quite a bit of slop or translation with foreign pronation and supination. And what this allows for is, again, that physiologic translation, that dorsal and volar subluxation of the distal ulna relative to the sigmoid notch is actually normal. In fact, if you look at the extremes of foreign pronation and supination, there's only about 10% of true articular contact between the joint surfaces. In pronation, the distal ulna translates approximately 2.8 millimeters dorsally. And with supination, you have translation up to 5.4 millimeters. You have both extrinsic and intrinsic stability of the DREJ. You have dynamic tensioning from the ECU tendon. The ECU tendon sheath and the subsheath also gives you quite a bit of stability, so injury to that structure can, in fact, give you DREJ instability. The pronator quadratus, which is a structure we routinely go through volar plating, also gives you dynamic stability. Especially in forearm pronation, what the pronator quadratus does is it co-ops the ulnar head into the sigmoid notch, giving that dynamic stability. The interosseous membrane also has important um, function as far as DREJ instability, both longitudinally as well as rotational stability. Looking at the intrinsic structures, you have your intrinsic ligaments, both superficial and deep with its insertion on the ulnar styloid in the fovea. And if you look at some of the superficial fibers over the styloid in the fovea with its insertion of the deep fibers of the ligament and subcurrentum. If you look at a lot of the biomechanical studies out there, there's certainly a plethora of these out there. You sort through, if you look at Shun's article, which is a classic article in 1991, the palmar ligaments are tied in supination, the dorsal ligaments are tied in pronation. And you go back and look back in the literature a decade earlier, Ekstam tells you that, no, it's in fact the palmar ligaments that are tied in pronation, and the dorsal ligaments are tied in supination. So this is where you're looking through the literature and you're thinking, wow, now I'm really, really confused. How do you reconcile the difference out there? Obviously, both studies are well controlled, well done. So what, in fact, is going on here? 
So if you look at the studies really carefully, both authors and both conclusions are actually quite correct. Shu was in fact looking at the superficial fibers. So if you look at the forearm in supination, the distal ulna has a tendency to sublux dorsally. What happens is your palmar superficial fibers are pulling the distal ulna more volarly, whereas the deep fibers on the dorsal aspect act as a tether, so it's preventing pathologic subluxation or dislocation of the distal ulna. And the converse is true if you look at forearm pronation. As we know, the distal ulna has a tendency to sublux more dorsally. So your superficial dorsal fibers are pulling this dorsally. And your deep fibers on the palmar surface is acting as a tether or a check ring to prevent pathologic dislocation or subluxation. Looking at the blood supply um, for the orthopedic uh, sports surgeons out there, much like the meniscus in the knee, the peripheral portion of the TFCC is well vascularized and have a tendency to heal quite well with repair. And you have branches from the anterior interosseous artery, which gives you perfusion. You also have branches coming into the ulnar fovea as well. This has important implications if you're looking at TFCC repairs, which ones do well with repair, which ones are treated typically with debridement. Um, if you look at the Palmer classification, breaking it down to 1A central tears. 1B, ulnar sided tears, 1C, more distal carpal sided tears, and 1D, radial sided tears. The approach for these, again, going back to vascularity, their central tears have very poor blood supply. So typically, somebody who comes in with a central tear has pain that fails conservative management. Your treatment, you're really looking at either debriding, some of the synovium and debriding the flaps, or ulnar shortening to off of the ulnar carpal joint. In contrast, ulnar sided tears, which are well vascularized, you can approach them as either an open or an arthroscopic repair. And radial sided tears are still quite controversial. If you have an unstable DREJ, I think it, and most authors will recommend that you should do a, a repair, either an open or arthroscopic. So how do you assess DREJ instability? We talked about technology a little bit. Um, in the last couple of days, you have MRIs, wrist arthroscopy and uh, certainly CT scan at your disposal, but I think it really goes back to your physical examination. Most patients coming in with dorsal subluxation of a DREJ have a prominent ulna dorsally. Tenderness over the fovea is really a sensitive way of picking up TFCC injuries. Form pronation and supination, if you have dorsal subluxation of distal ulna, leads to lack of supination. And also looking at belotment and translation of the DREJ in both pronation and supination in the piano key sign, comparing it with the contralateral side. If you look at the ECU, and it's important to see ECU subsheath, if you place the wrist in slight ulnar deviation, you pronate and supinate the forearm, you're looking for abnormal excursion of the ECU, looking for ECU tendon sheath injuries. This is a nice simple maneuver that was described in 1995. Um, look for instability. Basically, you're asking a patient to grip a chair and push off with their body weight, and what it does is it provides an axial ulnar side of load to the wrist, and if you have reproduction of ulnar side of wrist pain, it has a fairly high sensitivity for TFCC injuries. Radiographs, what are we looking for? A true PA, a true lateral, and pronation stress fees. And in some instances, a CT scan MR again, can be help, quite helpful. So oftentimes, a DREJ injury is quite obvious. This is a uh, gentleman that came to me with a galeazzo fracture dislocation previously treated with a cast with a radial shaft malunion, a very obvious DREJ injury. However, most of these are not so obvious. So we're looking for on a PA view, if you have a fracture at the base of the ulnar styla, again, that's your insertion of the superficial fibers, winding of the DREJ. Several studies have shown that if you have proximal migration of the distal radius, more than five millimeters, it's also consistent with a DREJ injury. But as we all know, DREJ instability is oftentimes very subtle. It's oftentimes missed. Here's a, a patient that has a PA and a lateral radiograph of the left wrist. But if you look at this a little bit more carefully, you have the pisiform, which is quite palmar, so it's really not a true lateral. If you ask for a repeat lateral of the wrist, you'll find that now you have a pisiform, which is in its position in the middle dirt between the scaphoid tubercle and the capitate. You have a slight dorsal subluxation of the distal ulna. And all all of us have been in clinic where we ask for a true lateral of the wrist and uh, certainly get quite a few variations out there as far as interpretation of a true lateral. I think it's really important to get a true lateral for assessment of DRUJ. A true lateral has been defined that if you take a true lateral, the pisiform should be sitting in the middle dirt between the anterior border of the scaphoid tubercle and the capitate. 
And even just a 10 degree deviation of a true lateral significantly reduces the accuracy of your examination. CT cans are helpful for looking at subtle subluxation or instability, as well as looking for malunions, articulate incongruity, and also sigmoid notch morphology. So the gentleman with dorsal subluxation of the distal ulna with a fairly flat sigmoid notch that's sublux on pronation and reduced in supination. A different patient here. In this one, you have a volar subluxation of the distal ulna on supination that reduces quite well pronation. So again, this helps you pick up really subtle instabilities. Also assess for, you know, is there a loose fragment? Is there articular incongruity that's preventing a reduction? MRIs may be helpful for assessment of TFCC injuries and also looking at your radial ulnar ligaments a little bit more closely. So I think a you know, question that's been looked at uh, quite extensively, especially with the AO study group, is looking at ulnar stylite fractures. So a patient with a standard volar play of the distal radius with a base to stylite fracture, do they need to be fixed? If you look at the anatomy again, your deep fibers actually insert into ulnar fovea, which is actually not your ulnar styloid. It's your more superficial fibers are probably not as important that's inserting into the styloid. So I think an injury that's a little bit more concerning that you should really look for is not so much the styloid fracture, but that's this little fleck, which is a uh, indication that there may be a TFCC avulsion off the cent fovea centralis. You might want to look for that on a radiograph as well if you're looking at the UAJ instability. So I think, again, several retrospective comparative studies have shown us that after fixation of a distal radius, you really have the same outcome with or without a styloid fracture, tip versus base. Whether you have displacement or no displacement really doesn't make a difference. And most non-unions are, in fact, asymptomatic. And more importantly, you have to look at the DRUJ. Somebody who is unstable in pronation but stable in supination, if you put them in supination, those superficial fibers are pulling the distal ulna volarly to give you stability and you treat them in a long cast. If you have instability in both pronation and supination, if you have a large fragment, it may be amenable to percutaneous fixation versus screw fixation or perhaps tension band wiring. In a small fragment, some people are proponents of open repair of the TFCC, or if you have something that you can reduce quite readily, you can certainly pin the DRUJ. In an isolated acute DRUJ instability or dislocation, Again, looking for instability in pronation and supination. If you can find a stable position, you can certainly mobilize an alarm cast. If it's unstable in all positions where you have very little stability, K-wire fixation just proximal sigmoid notch is one approach. What about somebody who comes in with a DRUJ that's dislocated, but no matter what you do, you cannot reduce the fracture. You cannot reduce the distal ulna. You can't have a complex dislocation where you have incarceration of the ECU tendon or perhaps the extensor to the small finger or TFCC fibers. The approach for this is generally to excise the retinacular over the fifth dorsal compartment. You raise the only base capsule retinacular flap, leaving the ECU tendon sheath completely intact if possible, and reattach the TFCC directly down to the fovea. Roosh et al., as, far as, as well as several authors, have advocated perhaps arthroscopic evaluation looking for TFCC injuries after a distal radius fracture. They've shown that with an arthroscopic repair, whether it's outside in or inside out, they actually do just as well as an open repair. So this is another technique that you could utilize in your practice as well as an arthroscopic or an open repair, depending on your comfort level. In a chronic dislocation, you're looking for malunion, a stylate fracture. Do you have a large fracture? Do you have a small fragment? Does it involve the TFCC? Joint congruity, are there reasons for a persistent dislocation or instability in the sigmoid notch? Arthritic changes, is it too late to do an acute reduction or a stabilization of the DRUJ? Functional bracing is certainly an option for a patient that's not a surgical candidate. Both off-the-shelf and custom braces have been shown to give you some volar and dorsal stability as far as preventing that physiologic subluxation, but most patients don't tolerate this as well. This case is where a CT scan, again, gives you a better idea what the sigmoid notch looks like. Gregory Bain, Australia, talks about using opening wedge osteotomy. You're trying to create that, reproduce either the volar or the dorsal buttress to prevent distal ulna subluxation with the opening wedge osteotomy and bone grafting. In the cases where you have nothing to repair, either an acute or a chronic injury, there are several ligamentous reconstructions that have been described, both intra and extra articular. One that I like to do is the one described by Brian Adams out of Iowa. You're basically using a tendon graft to recreate both the palmar and the dorsal ligaments and reattach it down to the fovea back to its anatomic insertion. I think in summary, soft tissue injuries are quite common distal radius fractures. It's really important to assess the DREJ after fixation of a distal radius. 
a true rally over the wrist is a very important, both preoperatively and intraoperatively, to look for DREJ instability. We talked about the importance of volar and distal and dorsal DREJ ligaments. And again, it's really the DREJ that matters, not so much the ulnar styloid. Again, welcome to Seattle. Next, Jeff Friedrich is going to talk this morning about uh, uh, distal uh, radius fractures and associated nerve injuries. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, so the title is Wrist uh, Fractures with Neurologic Deficits, but what we're really talking about is what do you do about carpal tunnel syndrome with a distal radius fracture? I'm going to talk about some of the other less common nerve injuries, but really I, I think what people want to know is what do you do about that median nerve that's uh, suffering a little bit after a most commonly the distal radius fracture, although it can be with other things like a perilunate fracture dislocation or uh, the like. So what, what are we talking about? As I said, mostly median, but sometimes ulnar nerve dysfunction of the wrist uh, or after wrist injury. Uh, and what wrist injuries are they? Uh, far and away, it's a distal radius fracture, at least from our experience here. Uh, but uh, certainly with perilunate dislocations, uh, or radial carpal dislocations, these can happen, but uh, it's most commonly the distal radius. So the incidence, uh, what is the incidence? Well, it, it, we're not entirely sure, but it seems to be low, uh, 2 to 7 percent, depending on which article you choose to read. Um, and the risk factors that have been found are uh, fracture translation, and I think that's the big one. How much is that uh, fracture translated uh, prior to reduction? High energy injuries can uh, uh, lead to these nerve dysfunctions. And then splinting in the, uh, in the flex position, although this is now largely uh, defunct, that cotton loader position in which the wrist is severely flexed. I, I think we've, uh, we as a hand sur surgery community have uh, hopefully um, uh, made that uh, non-existent now. And so here's, uh, here's just an example of someone that uh, probably is at a high risk, and you'll see this case again later on. I have some examples, but uh, that's, that's about a 200% translation. That's a lot of translation of that distal radius fracture, not to mention the shortening end. You can see uh, it goes beyond the soft tissue, so it's uh, now out of the soft tissue envelope. So obviously high energy and obviously a lot of translation, and so uh, I, I think the antenna at this point should be going up uh, on cases like this if you, uh, if you see them. So how much translation puts one at risk for the carpal, uh, for median nerve dysfunction or ulnar nerve dysfunction? That's a good question. Um, uh, Dr. Ring, and, and I like to say you don't have to look hard to find a good distal radius uh, paper on pretty much anything in that realm by uh, Dr. Ring and his group. Uh, but they found that patients with carpal tunnel syndrome associated with distal radius fracture had a mean of 50% translation when compared with patients with a distal radius fracture without carpal tunnel syndrome who only had a mean translation of 27 percent. That, that's sort of a thumbnail guideline, but um, we don't know at which, where the breakpoint is really about how much translation really uh, puts you at a high risk for carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, so we, we know the treatment. It's uh, carpal tunnel release, preferably within 24 hours, and then some nuances to that, which I'll talk about. Uh, and we also know the sequelae if it's untreated numbness. Uh, intrinsic muscle weakness in the hand, especially with the thenar musculature, uh, and pain, uh, none of which are trivial uh, outcomes uh, following this problem. So I guess the big question is, do all patients with carpal tunnel, tunnel syndrome following a distal radius fracture uh, need to be released? Uh, and and you, we can probably stop the sentence right there. Do they all need to be released? And then the, the, the segue question to that would be, do they need to be released right now? Uh, and so we'll use some examples to talk about that. So uh, let, let me briefly touch on ulnar nerve injury uh, with wrist injuries. These are fairly rare, 25 cases reported in the literature. Uh, apparent associations are somewhat similar to the median nerve injury, high energy fractures or injuries, uh, and an associated ulna fracture, neither of which are uh, big surprises. I think those are fairly intuitive. Uh, most commonly, these are neuropraxias that uh, ha have seen resolution later on. So the diagnosis with uh, nerve deficit is chiefly physical exam and serial physical exam uh, right from the get-go and, and uh, frequently thereafter. Uh, 
role of electrical testing, it, early on there's not much of a role. Um, it, it's not helpful acutely and it usually does not become reliable until at least three weeks after an injury and perhaps more. Uh, so certainly the night of, um, you know, there's not much other than physical exam that you can use to rely on to, to diagnose a, uh, a carpal tunnel syndrome or a median nerve injury and its evolution. So do all carpal tunnel, do all median nerve deficits need to be released stat that night? Maybe not, although this is, I think, certainly up for debate and it's not something that with our literature we've uh, definitively solved. Uh, so I'm going to present three scenarios here. One is nerve dysfunction from time zero, from the time of impact, really. Uh, progressive nerve dysfunction and then nerve dysfunction following treatment, either reduction and or uh, uh, fixation. So scenario one, uh, and these are all patients of my own that uh, had these actual um, uh, scenarios. So the first one is a 20-foot fall from a scaffold onto a hand. Uh, the thumb index and middle finger were numb uh, since injury. Uh, the, the patient never lost consciousness. He very reliably says uh, these were numb, you know, uh, from the moment I became cognizant of the fact that I had a hand injury. He's got a comminuted distal radius fracture, which you see here, um, not a lot of translation, although it's, uh, it, it's quite impacted. So he really just stuffed his wrist into his, uh, into his forearm. And so that's a high energy injury. Again, from Dr. Ring's series, that, that's, uh, that's a risk. Um, so the median nerve injury is best we can tell, and we were fairly confident about this. It, it happened with the fall or at, at impact. Uh, does not appear to be due to rising pressure within the carpal tunnel at um, quite likely is due to a direct injury to the nerve. Uh, release, I, I say probably warranted at the time of surgery, and we did that. We fixed his fracture, we released his carpal tunnel, and his median nerve symptoms persisted and really have never abated, uh, despite a lot of hand wringing on my part. Um, so, and, and he's had persistent numbness and now pain for, for years. So scenario two is a uh, young male involved in a motor vehicle accident. No numbness initially, um, you know, from the time point at which he can remember being cognizant of having a wrist injury, but it, at least in the emergency department, it was progressively worsening. So here's his x-rays. The AP, you can see, it, it's not entirely impressive. It does have shortening, but on the lateral, you can see a significant amount of translation. I would argue that's at least 100% translated, perhaps 125. And again, we know that that's a, probably a risk and he was having uh, what we call progressive median nerve deficit. It, uh, he, he maybe had a little bit of tingling uh, when he first got to the emergency room, and now it's getting more and more uh, numb as the evening uh, goes by. So we feel that that indicates increasing uh, pressure within the carpal tunnel, uh, whether that's from edema or hematoma or all of the above. Um, and I, I feel like urgent release is probably indicated because that's that's an evolving situation and you want to arrest that, um, uh, as Dr. Hansen talked about yesterday, that uh, positive feedback cycle that can be seen essentially with, with carpal tunnels, I mean with uh, compartment syndrome because in a way that's what this is. Um, so we did his, uh, we went ahead and did him that night, did his uh, fracture fixation and um, I'm happy to say I don't use a volar plate for everything as you can see here. So we use some intrafocal pinning. Um, and so it's a, the fracture pattern was relatively simple, uh, but with that significant translation, I think that's probably what predisposed him to that uh, injury. So we went ahead and did the, the carpal tunnel release uh, at that same time. And, and over the next few days, his uh, median nerve still had some numbness and tingling, but that pretty rapidly got better after surgery, much to our, uh, uh, we were pretty pleased about that, obviously. And so then there's scenario three. A uh, 45-year-old male uh, involved in a motorcycle accident. He had a comminuted distal radius fracture, a normal neurologic exam prior to surgery, um, and we did a fixation of his distal radius fracture. Um, you can see the, it's a little bit difficult to see here. He's got a comminuted distal radius uh, and actually a scaphoid fracture. Um, and here are those fixed. Uh, I certainly, in looking back at my results, can improve on my plate placement, but um, he um, then began developing uh, progressive numbness and tingling in the median nerve distribution. Uh, 
That was not relieved by bivalving the splint. And so we took him back to the operating room emergently because this, again, is an evolving compartment syndrome. Uh, and so here's his release. This is our original incision from here to here. We extended it all the way into the forearm, and then uh, this is prior to making our, we hitched it over to the, uh, to release the carpal tunnel. And again, thankfully, his, uh, his compartment syndrome and carpal tunnel syndrome defervesced uh, after injury, or after release. So, I, I, and I think we can sort of extend the scenario three, which is uh, worsening nerve symptoms after uh, treatment to, I think, the subacute period, even in the week or two after surgery. Uh, sometimes these, uh, once in a great while, we see people that have worsening numbness and tingling once they've come back to clinic and may be developing a, um, uh, a positive, I would mean, a, uh, an early chronic regional pain syndrome or what used to be called RSD. And I think those people warrant uh, early and aggressive uh, uh, intervention, at the very least, um, aggressive physical therapy and perhaps consideration for carpal tunnel release, although, again, that can be uh, fairly controversial. And then there are the really unusual cases. Um, this was a, a case of mine. Uh, this is a 14-year-old male. He was climbing in a tree about 30 feet up, and he took a, took a spill and really had a bad injury constellation. He had a severe liver laceration. Our, my trauma surgery colleagues tell me it was one of the worst ones they had ever seen. And he had a head injury. He had bilateral distal radius fractures. And he was intubated in the ICU for a week. So that confounds things when you can't really get a good examination of the patient. So here's his, uh, he had, as I said, bilateral distal radius fractures. This is the left side. Again, nearly 100% translation. Uh, here's the right side, probably 150 to 200% translation. Um, and this is that one that I showed you before. This is the uh, radius sticking out of the skin. Uh, this is reduction the night of on the left. That's, you know, not great, but it's, you know, it's okay for someone that's in the, uh, in the ICU and unstable. And then this is his uh, reduction film on the right. So he was finally extubated after a week um, and uh, became stable enough that we could A, examine him, and B, start to think about uh, treatment. And he had a variable neurologic exam with both hands. Uh, we thought that was initially due to uh, his mental status and his ability to, to cooperate with us. Um, but we took him to the operating room and uh, surprisingly he had, you know, through that open wound that the distal radius went through on the right side, uh, we were somewhat surprised to find that that's his median nerve. And uh, the uh, metaphysis of the distal radius had just sliced right through it. Um, so we. Uh, fix that with sural nerve grafts, and um, this is his uh, left side after percutaneous fixation, his right side. Uh, not surprisingly, he uh, may have a physial arrest there, but he's mid-teen years, so that probably is not going to be a problem. Uh, but that, that's a, an unusual case. You know, most of these median nerve deficits are going to be to neuropraxia, but don't rule out uh, an actual structural injury to the nerve itself. So in summary, wrist injury with an instant uh, non-progressive, it can't progress because it's already is, uh, you know, fairly bad, nerve compromise. Uh, we, I believe that that warrants carpal tunnel release, uh, but probably don't need to do it that night, don't need to do it ASAP. It's the progressive ones that need to be done that night, and these are essentially evolving car uh, compartment syndromes. Uh, the change after manipulation, either, either, either after a reduction or fixation, uh, again, that's an evolving compartment syndrome. Uh, and, you know, at the very least, take down the splint, see if that relieves it, and consider nerve release. And then uh, common things are common, but uh, don't, uh, don't forget about in the back of your mind some more unusual, as I said, structural injury to the nerve, although it's, it's quite rare. Thank you very much. Any questions for Jeff? Yeah, microphone. When you have the scenario, you decide to release it. Do you use the same, do you extend your incision, or do you just make a standard carpal tunnel incision uh, to avoid the pomerocutaneous branch? Uh, you know, a lot of these were obviously, um, uh, you know, at least with the one case I showed, going uh, through a volar approach, and you can just extend it distally. Uh, the other one that I showed, was a percutaneous fixation, so I, I, you know, 
don't make my, I, I do a limited open carpal tunnel release, and so I, I, I tend to make it more generous than that uh, so that I can uh, get a good visualization because unlike our usual carpal tunnel releases, that carpal tunnel is usually filled with blood and edema, so I, I make a more generous uh, release. But if I'm already going volar for a volar play, yes, I'll, I'll just extend it distally. And then uh, in these in times when you have median nerve palsy and then also just in general, your thoughts are the other people's thoughts on the use of vitamin C. There's that one prospective RCT, but should we be doing this with everybody or just those with nerve injuries or nobody? I, I, at least the, uh, with, um, you know, that position paper came out from the uh, uh, Academy of Orthopedics and um, recommending vitamin C for uh, these distal radius fractures because it did appear to decrease the incidence of uh, chronic regional pain syndrome. Uh, and so we're, we're slowly adopting that, um, but I, I haven't been selective about it from the application of people with nerve injuries. So. I have a question. On the, on the late, uh, late development of um, uh, median nerve compression symptoms, say a f you know, few weeks later, and you're worried about them also developing a chronic regional pain syndrome, you're going to go in and release their median nerve, do you do anything like steroids or anything at the same time uh, besides hand therapy to get them going? What are your thoughts on that? I, I have it, and you know, I mean, boy, there's been a lot of medications tried for chronic regional pain syndrome in general. Uh, I haven't used any um, medical adjuncts. Anybody else have you used anything? Let me, so, let me comment on the, the guidelines, the AOS guidelines. Um, that, that's a growing experience, I think, for all of us. First of all, they're evidence-based guidelines. It, it's basically a roadmap of what evidence we don't have, which we really don't have as much as people imagine we do, and, and what we need. <clears throat> and I, I was on that panel. That, that, and I think we learned from that. I, I wasn't at the group that when they met first. What the first thing you do is you ask the questions. And, and what we learned from this experience is you got to ask your questions carefully, because we should never have asked that question. We, you know, it's, it's kind of a really stupid, irrelevant question, really. And the thing is, there was two randomized trials done by the same guy who's an advocate of this. And so, and you knew what the answer was going to be. The answer was going to be. And you're referring to the vitamin C. Yeah, vitamin right. C. You're going to have right. level one evidence, and, and you know right. your answer's going to come out like that, and then you're going to have to say it's great. Mm -hmm. So the only defense to that is, my love, science. And Margaret McQueen redid the study, no difference. Uh, she hasn't published it yet. We need other people to redo it. I, d I really don't think vitamin C has anything to do with it. I'll have more to say this afternoon. The only reassuring thing about that is that you know vitamin C is no longer under patent, so it's uh, <laughs> le <laughs> le it's cheap. Le le less of a less of a conflict of interest there, Dr. Yeah, Dan. Uh, Dr. Perry, quick question on uh, your scenario one, where you uh, had a patient who was awake, had a fall, known median nerve symptoms immediately completely out. Do you explore that nerve at the time that you fix the uh, fracture, or uh, do you just do a carpal tunnel release? It was, it was kind of unclear. I, I, I just did a carpal tunnel release. Okay. Um, and I, are you referring to, beyond that, doing a neurolysis? And it, yeah, like an external neurolysis and just making sure that you don't have a laceration. No, you'd, you'd visualize the nerve. When you're right. in fixing the fracture, you'd visualize the nerve in its place associated with the fracture. With, I think, with, but, with a closed yeah. injury, yeah. I, 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 didn't and I, I probably wouldn't. Although you know that's that's certainly that's a very people could argue with that. That's a very astute question, and, and Bill and I were talking about it because your your last case with the median nerve transection. So uh, when when you were talking about the guy who reported, I've been numb since I from the moment I fell, and he could clearly report that. That does kind of raise a red flag for me, because yeah. ca acute carpal tunnel takes a while to develop. In fact, 24, 48 hours even post op. Um, and, I, and because we do volar exposures, I probably, I probably would have peeked over and looked at that nerve. It's right there. Um, but I'm not sure I would have. I'm not right. sure I would have. Well, and, and they, you know, the, I think the segue to that is, at least with volar plating or a volar approach to, this, to the distal radius, should we just release all, all the carpal tunnels? And, you know, because some people would argue, well, you're, you're there. You need to make your incision a couple of inches longer. But I, I, I think carpal tunnel release is not a benign procedure, it certainly has potential for complications. And if so... they don't have symptoms, I don't think you would. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they don't have symptoms. But there are people that are, I, I think do argue that if you're in a, doing a volar approach, just do the carpal tunnel release. There, so. There's an old British article, and I don't know if it's in the British uh, Journal of Bone and Joint or in STO or something, but I looked one evening for it last week, and 
it talks about finding spicules of bone at the level of the fracture in the median nerve and advocated uh, a release of the fascia. So I just always, if I've got symptoms, I always just go over and, and look at the nerve at the time of fracture care. But I make a separate incision in the palm, mm -hmm. and I try to leave a skin bridge between mm -hmm. the distal palm reflection crease and my limited open carpal tunnel, because you can see the nerve, you can retract it, mm -hmm. you can explore it through your fracture care site if you got it open. But if you don't have it open, make a little secondary incision, look at your nerve at the fracture site if you do dorsal pinning or, or, or orthogonal pinning or, or capangi pinning. And, and for you, what is that uh, second incision versus continuation of your roller incision? What, what's I just don't like all the, the tendons hanging out. Yeah. <laughs> I like to have the palmar yeah. fascia, that fat, that skin, yeah. and just a normal palm because you want to get them moving if you're yeah. going to fix them. So just one let more inhibition of pain, you know, kind sure. of thing. Yeah, and certainly if you're going to do a compartment release associated with the carpal tunnel release, leave that skin bridge because otherwise you will be looking at yeah, tendons looking in the nerves. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, uh, the next talk is going to be uh, David Ring talking to us about um, intercarpal injuries associated with wrist fractures. This is, this is basically a review. I don't, probably not all of you were here yesterday, but uh, Jeff Wang's group showed uh, looking at uh, CT to try to diagnose scaphalunate. So it's really more of a review than anything. So uh, let's talk about scaphoid fracture first. If you have a minimally displaced scaphoid fracture, one you could treat in a cast. And a lot of times we get CAT scans for distal radius fractures that like we talked about yesterday as well. So you pretty much, you're pretty confident that it's not displaced. You could just cast that part of it, but then you have to mobilize the wrist. So we end up fixing those. And you, you can either extend the volar approach, you, you know, one more zag if you, if you zigzag and you're, and you're there. Um, and of course, if it's displaced, which many of them are, uh, or if you have any concerns that it might be, and we, we've been looking at some data now where even CAT scan can't tell you if it's unstable, what that means we don't know, but you can certainly extend your volar approach, go through there, look at it, reduce it, and fix it. And if it's, if it's uh, I noticed uh, one of Jeff's cases the, 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 the had a dorsal percutaneous scape where you could do the non-displaced percutaneously. Um, it, it's, we also talked about, again, if you think you have a scape lunate, that will be at odds then with your fracture repair to some degree if you if you repair it, you put pins. Most people, when they put the pins, they like to leave them at least 10 to 12 weeks. What, uh, what we've been doing uh, with perilunates is using screws, so it's more like just a big K wire, and you can let them move their mid-carpal joint and, and take those out even three months later. And so I, I, I have done that in the few I've treated concomitantly just so I can move the wrist, but sometimes they are at odds. We, I just wanted to illustrate some of the things we were mentioning in the discussion, and that is this uh, Shenton's line, or if you pull pull uh, traction and you can see the, the Galula's line gets, gets uh, messed up and this is a, a drawing by Diego Fernandez uh, and you can, you know, this, you can do this, you can put him under the C-arm before you fix it, fix it, do it again and pr I think this, pr my, my thought is that this will catch most of the really important ones that, that you probably ought to be looking at. Um, we do see these down the line that we've missed and this is something, it's, it is on people's radar, that's why we saw the research yesterday. Uh, it's not quite clear what it means or how it influences the injury or how common it is yet. When you see the old chauffeur's fracture, as they call it, the radial styloid fracture, that's one to really, there's a strong association there. Um, and even a compression fracture with a lot of displacement with the, of the radial styloid, you can imagine how that injury might continue right up there and get it. So this, this is the one I actually put a lot of attention into and um, I actually do these, uh, these are not very common, but I do them arthroscopically. It's the one I do arthroscopically. I can get a look at that ligament. You could also just do a, uh, a dorsal exposure and cut the capsule and look in. So the best, the best data on, on this um, comes from, and we were talking about this yesterday, about what would the reference standard or gold standard be for whether or not there was an injury and how bad it was, and that would be probably looking at it with a scope. So that was done by uh, Tommy Lindau's group. And they had 51 patients that they prospectively scoped and uh, found uh, 10 grade 3 SL injuries, no grade 4, so no completely ruptured, but some that they could sort of drive into or, or, or were gapped. With. And then all the other ones were, who knows, you know, who knows what these are. I don't know really what those mean. I mean, how many of that, how much of that was pre-existing? 
um, normal anatomic variance, how much of it's traumatic, nobody knows, and what does it mean and what does it matter. Even the grade threes are, are, are a little bit less clear than the grade fours for me, and they really didn't see much going on with the LT ligament. Um, their, their risk factor, different than the one, is, this is what I noticed yesterday, is that in the CT study yes, yesterday, ulnar variance had nothing to do with it. It was the only risk factor in, in, uh, in this study. So, you know, it's just, it, who knows, there's a lot of reasons why there might be that difference. A lot, of, lot more work to be done in this area. And then probably the most interesting thing is they actually had outcomes. So they looked at, uh, they tried to look at uh, uh, whether there was any difference. They did find some uh, differences in, in the angle and, uh, and appearance of, and dissociation. And the only thing that was different was pain. Uh, there was no difference in motion, grip, or pinch. So uh, how, how, much of it, how much of a difference it makes in the short term? It didn't seem to make much except for pain. And then long term, obviously, we would expect to see arthritis, but we don't, we don't know how these do over the long term compared to if you just break your radius alone. And that's, there's not much known about this. That's pretty much the extent of it, and there's still a lot of room for art in this area. Thanks. All right. The last lecture of uh, this segment is going to be my long-term partner, Chris Allen, talking about uh, external fixation. Does it still have a role, and if so, what? <laughs> no. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so X-Fix, still relevant. This has been around for a long time. I think Tom Fisher told us that this, was, uh, this goes back over 100 years. And Ambra Dan came up with this idea. This doesn't look too much different than what we've been doing recently. It's a very good idea if you pull things out. You can distract fractures and stabilize them briefly. And uh, so you can take impacted fractures and reduce them. And then you're left with the issue of stabilizing. But this is a good first step and actually comprises the first step in fracture reduction for cases even with vulgar plating. Uh, AO, as they have done with many types of fixation, came up with some fine points. Um, you can wiggle this thing around. It doesn't get you your reduction. You have to get your reduction and then stabilize it with the X-Fix. Uh, the AO folks, if you have an upper extremity, it's indicated for surgery, it would seem, by this list. But um, if you narrow it down, X-Fix is useful. If you can't obtain and maintain reduction in closed fashion with a splint or just pins, if for some reason you can't get it with RAF, you've seen some of these smashes that Jeff showed and that uh, where ORAF would have been a challenge. Sometimes an X-Fix can get you what you need. Or if you just can't do it because of the soft tissue envelope or you've got polytrauma, you need to move quickly. Uh, how do they do for intraarticular dysphagia fractures? Actually pretty well, according to this report. This goes back about a decade, uh, but their point was that um, the folks who on balance did the best were treated with external fixation, and, and they uh, felt that this had to do with the soft tissue stripping that happens with ORIF and some of the impairment of motion. Uh, I, in the interest of fairness, can say that a couple of reports have come back, come out since this time, suggesting that with careful soft tissue techniques, ORIF actually is better. And I think that's, that's probably true. Pitfalls are many, and we'll go through them one by one, so I won't read them to you here. But pin tract infections are common, one in five in, in a large series. Uh, treated successfully with just antibiotics, nobody had a long-term bone infection. They look like heck, and so there's one up at the proximal pin site and a close-up view of the ugliness. So uh, the treatment for this is get these pins the heck out and get x-rays and make sure you don't have an osteo that's going to need curatage. <coughs> get them on antibiotics. But happily so far, knock on my wooden head, uh, I haven't had any long-term problems with pin sites, though I don't use these very much. You're going to see this business of the bridge plate, so we'll show you that. Uh, so as I said, antibiotics usually get you out of the woods on the pin site infections. Range of motion is a problem if you just lock them in. That's true with ORAF as well. If you're going to fix them, fix them in a stable enough fashion that you can move them because nothing hurts results like uh, letting the thing just sit there and bake and develop stiffness. And uh, whether you move them ahead of time or after the fixer comes off, move, move, move. Uh, Non-bridging X fixes offer some advantages. Margaret McQueen has published on this extensively. So this looks pretty good, and you can actually get them moving early, and they did better with this construct rather than extending past the radiocarpal joint. But obviously, if you have a ridiculous amount of interarticular comminution, uh, this may not be your tool of choice because it doesn't protect the radiocarpal joint. And I. I think I'm not alone in having had folks collapse and uh, what looked like a good reduction in the OR uh, 
look a lot less good later on with this sort of uh, business, even with the volar plate, truth be told. Uh, I've never seen so far an injury of the radial sensory nerve, but it seems like a reasonable thing to talk about. It's right there for your proximal pin cluster. Um, we'll talk about this and its consequences with bridge plating as well. And it's also important to remember there are little branches distally, which can be just as irritated. These things can break. This is a 76-year-old gentleman who I'm sure wasn't doing handstands, but managed to have enough force across this that he broke his pins proximal here. So you can see right here. And so there you're left with a challenge. First, you have to stabilize the fracture if it's not yet healed. And second, you have some hardware to go chasing. And the treatment for that might be, in addition to locking him down, to use just the bigger pins. So this is the AO set, and the top pins there are 2.5 millimeters, but you can go with these 4.0 shant screws, and that might be the better, the better way to go. Uh, you can increase the stability of a fixer by using more pins, having them closer together, having more bars, having the bars closer to the skin, and linking the bars. So that might look like something uh, as shown here. And I liked, again, Tom Fisher. I keep complimenting him and quoting him, and he's gone. But he had that little, uh, uh, what he called a fixer, just applied on the, the radial column. And so that sort of um, takes you to the idea of the bridge plate, which is basically an internal fixator, uh, which we'll get to in just a moment. You can increase stability with this additional pin. This was uh, a group publishing this about eight years ago in JBDS, showing that this additional pin through the styloid significantly increased stiffness of the construct. And minimized loss of reduction. You can do this wrong. There's no tool that can't be used incorrectly. I prove that routinely. Uh, this is a guy that I thought would do well with an X fix and pins, and I have no idea what I was thinking 10 years ago, or if I was, but maybe I was scared off by this, uh, this galeasi fixation from a prior uh, injury. He's a 30-year-old Microsoft employee that has a six-foot-long, um, I guess you'd call it a body-type skateboard, and just likes to go downhill fast. And uh, so I, you know, God love him, but um, so he had this fracture, and I uh, pinned it and X fixed it, and it uh, looked not great, but it looked a lot less great at three weeks. So I went back and did the right thing eventually. You can see it so long ago we, we did not even have the locking boiler plates, but he eventually did okay. This is a little old lady with poor bone stock, um, who is by Dave Ring's definition elderly since she's older than me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so she's got all this missing bone, and we put on, we plated the ulna, X fixed the radius. She started to fall apart, and uh, screws are pulling out. Everything's collapsing, so we just splinted her, or casted her, and she actually uh, healed up. So that I, I think this oblique view must mean that it looks so terrible on the AP that I didn't want to show it. I, I'd like to think I went back and <laughs> pulled this out, but I, I can't promise you I did. So what about bridge plating? This is actually a mandibular plate, a 2-4 locking plate from the Synthes mandibular tray, and Doug Hannell taught me this, and I think it was Burke who first wrote about it. But you can just uh, take the manubrial angle out of this thing with benders and slip this underneath the uh, ECRL, ECRB, and get longitudinal distraction and pull things out to length and uh, pin the ulna if need or, or plate it. This has been studied. Burke originally would open the fracture and uh, fix it with K-wires, bone graft, and then offload this with this distraction plate and then take them out later. So that's a second procedure, keep in mind. And so you may risk that radial sensory nerve proximally or distally. But it can work well in many situations, and it's been studied by other authors uh, who show that it's as simple as, less expensive than, and accepted as well as, and has fewer complications than X-Fix. And biomechanically has been shown in this uh, report from CORE to do as well as or better than X-Fix in every single parameter assessed. And they compared a couple of different plates. So here's a, a gal who had this fracture, which um, uh, was not her only injury. So one of the things that happens here with all the polytrauma is we like to get folks moving, ambulating. So I like to be able to fix them in such a way that they can bear weight through the elbow with a platform walker. And so um, John Agee's business about distracting and using ligament attacks to effect your reduction is something we do all the time. You can just see the finger traps pulling us out to length, slipping this mandibular plate. This is some years back. Um, we have a new plate I'll show you in a minute. Uh, a little wire tied here, pull it through, a bunch of uh, K wires and uh, things are lined up reasonably well. Uh, so another fracture in a, another patient with uh, some leg injuries as well. Combination comes up pretty proximally, so that makes it tough. Your volar plate has to come back several screw holes proximal to this if you're going to plate it volarly. So this thing gets you past the zone of injury, 
pulls things out to length and maintains it pulled out. You want to not over distract here, the mid-carpal joint in particular, because you can give them stiffness down the line. But uh, comes out a little ulnar plus, I see this, but he actually did great in every parameter that we look for with range of motion and pretty quickly as well. Um, another one with, uh, you could, again, there are a uh, million ways to skin a fish, but uh, this is one way and um, gets you everything lined up like you like. So it's, as Doug Hannell says, it doesn't how you get there as long as you do get where you're headed. And so healed, and I see this angulation, I'm not sure that matters uh, down the line, but if it does, then obviously we'll have to think about a different way to go about this. This is a synthy sort of a, our rep was telling me it's sort of a semi-custom deal, but we did have a guy tumble in who was uh, from Greece who had one of these in perfect apply, so it must not be that difficult to obtain. Um, this is the plate we use now. Rounded smooth edges, uh, some of those serrations on the mandibular plate <coughs> led to tendon ruptures with uh, retrieval of plate after the fracture was healed. So we haven't had that problem since this has been devised and it's lower profile, 2-4 locking plate. I have no financial interest, but uh, it does work well. Here's a fellow who uh, also had lower extremity fractures. He's got a difficult to see here scaphoid fracture. And um, here, he's got separation of the volar cortex from the articular surface. And I am not as deft as some of the volar platers if I have separation here because I end up having difficulty getting this thing, the articular surface where I want since it's no longer attached to the place where I'm sticking my screws. You could argue just uh, an issue with surgeon uh, imperfection. But uh, we can get him out. This, I see the gaps, I see the step offs, but we got all this stuff uh, distracted so that he could actually bear weight through his elbow on his uh, walker while he waited for his uh, talus fractures to heal. And so plates out. This looks terrible, I grant you. I mean, it's uh, grossly overall aligned, but his range of motion is this. He's got 90, 90, 90, 90, and he's, it's a credit to him. He's about 50 years old. He looks like he's about 30 and he works hard at, at getting a good outcome. But it uh, just goes to show you, you never know what's, what's going to give you the outcome you want. Sometimes it could be this. The volar ulnar corner has been written about as sort of the bugaboo of, uh, in particular, the volar plate. Difficult to get to through the standard FCR approach. Difficult to instrument. And so we had this youngster who actually, with distraction, corrected this uh, slight dorsal displacement and volar collapse pretty nicely. Here's the little, little uh, volar chunk. So I thought... Well, let's see what the volar plate does with nothing else. We don't even need a K wire to hold that up. And uh, it shouldn't work. It turns out, John Agee's told me since I did this that um, there isn't really a ligamentous attachment, so ligamentous, ligament ataxis won't work here. But I didn't know that when I did this. So uh, it actually worked fine, thanks to my ignorance. <laughs> it's like the bumblebee can't fly, but he doesn't know it, so he keeps flying around. Uh, and with the plate out at uh, three months, this is doing just fine, and so is he. So uh, there are problems. I have had um, skin breakdown before we got the new low contour plate. A couple of uh, distal wounds did very poorly. You can have a non-union. I've had at least one of those. I've also broken the metacarpal uh, through eccentric placement in one of the distal screws. And you do have to go back and take it out. So you can argue uh, whether that helps you or hurts you. Um, so to summarize, XFIX has its advantages and its disadvantages. But the bridge plate is another way to sort of do, I'll quote Tom Fisher, I still use an X-Fix and just put it right on the bone. And I can't say it's an arrow in my quiver or Jeff Friedrich will throw a clod. He says he hates that expression, but I'll say it's, a, it's an extension to your list of tools, especially for the bag of bones, distal radius, and in the polytrauma patient. Thanks. Thank